Okay, let's make a start. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to the inaugural A3D3 seminar. Um, our intent to ha is have one of these um, the first Monday of each month um, at this particular time. And we will be cycling through um, high energy physics. Next month will be in multi messenger astronomy. Then April's will be neuroscience and then um, hardware for um, AI acceleration. Then we'll have an inter one, we'll have a keynote one, and then we'll be back into HEP in six months' time. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, our opening speaker. Um, Carl Kramer is currently a professor of physics at New York University um, and associated with the Center for Data Science. And he will become the next director of the American Family Insurance Data Science Institute on the 1st of July this year and join the faculty at University of Wisconsin-Madison Department of Physics uh, with an associate or an affiliate appointment statistics. Uh, Kyle is an experimental particle physicist working primarily on LHC, um, and he developed a framework enabling collaborative statistical modeling, which was used extensively in the discovery of the Higgs boson in July 2012. His current interests are the interaction of physics, statistics, and machine learning, and so he fits very nicely into the areas of expertise that we hope A3D3 will be developing over the next five years. Um, Kyle obtained his PhD in physics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison 2005 and his BA in math and physics from Rice University. He was awarded a Presidential Early Career Award for Science and Engineering in 2007, um, an NSF Career Award in 2009, and elected an American Physical Society Fellow in 2021. And today you will be talking about accelerating simulation-based inference. Uh, so with that, I'll hand over to Kyle. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, it's good to see a good turnout for this inaugural event. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, probably most people that are joining, uh, you know, already knew about from the A3D3 mailing list, but maybe some people, uh, you know, saw some announcement on Twitter or something. <laughs> but um, this group is focused largely, it's a, you know, a, 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 a institute that's funded by the National Science Foundation that's focusing largely on accelerators and the kind of computing aspects and how to uh, enable, uh, you know, AI advances uh, in the sciences. Um, and so with this talk, I, I tried to, uh, uh, you know, sort of de-emphasize some of the uh, statistical side of it and then try to uh, point out some of the places where uh, the computing challenges come in. Um, so I will talk uh, first about sort of simulation based inference, which is an area that I'm very excited about. I will try to make uh, connections along the way to the computing challenges that you run into and the sort of new patterns that are that, you, that we run into compared to what we're used to maybe and at least in high energy physics. And I'll touch on not just high energy physics, but also some topics in multi messenger astronomy, and just to touch uh, briefly on computational neuroscience. Um, so I'll start by just uh, uh, recognizing, you know, all the stuff that I'm doing these days is very, you know, interacting with all sorts of computer scientists and statisticians and physicists of different stripes, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And so here's a a collection of some of the people that are maybe most closely connected to uh, this work. Um, I see that uh, Jill is uh, is uh, connected. Hi, Jill. Um, and uh, okay, so I will start off just with the observation, uh, which is that science is replete with high fidelity simulators. And here's a sort of a distant scales going from the very small with particle colliders to the very very large, like the evolution of our universe with uh, all sorts of things in the middle, like uh, epidemics, uh, you know, something the size of your brain, like neuron activity, uh, proteins, et cetera. We have, we have simulators at all of these different scales. And those simulators, they can generate synthetic data that looks like the real data. Um, and so in a machine learning language, you might call them generative models. Uh, but there are more than just generative models. Uh, they also, they have the underlying causal mechanism that the scientists think is actually, you know, responsible for producing the data inside of them. So they're, they're causal generative models of the data generating process, and they really, you know, encode 
a, you know, a, a enormous amount of what we understand as scientists. So when we think about, you know, how do you incorporate more domain expertise into machine learning? Well, one way is to work with the simulators. Um, so when you take these simulators and you pair them with, you know, expressive programming languages and, uh, and a lot of computing power that we have in, you know, modern, uh, you know, computational uh, uh, data centers and things like this, uh, we can generate a lot of uh, synthetic data and it ma can, and oftentimes matches the real data extremely well. And that's what I mean by, you know, that it's high fidelity. Um, so this is great. Um, the, these computational uh, capabilities paired with all of this, uh, you know, domain knowledge that goes into the simulators. Um, unfortunately, these simulators are poorly suited for statistical inference. So you can use them to generate data that looks like the real data, but uh, but once you you know collect some real data, it's hard to use those simulators to say something about the underlying phenomena. Um, so and and I'll explain a little bit more about why, why that is. So, but just to establish some some terminology and some symbols. Um, I'm thinking about uh, the direction going to the right as the sort of predictive direction or the forward modeling direction or the simulation direction where you take some parameters of your simulator and you use it to generate some, uh, some synthetic data X. Um, and the observed data X would also be over here. Um, and the, the parameters of your simulator once you can talk about more, but they could be things like uh, the masses of particles or uh, some some uh, parameters that describe the you know a model in computational neuroscience, or they could be uh, parameters that describe uh, you know black holes uh, in spiraling and merging uh, that are observed in LIGO or something. Those are the parameters of interest theta, um, and so that predictive direction is the simulator. And what we would like to do is do the inverse problem. Uh, uh, which is inference, which is based on some observed data, say something about the parameters of interest. Um, so this, uh, um, so you can call this, you know, an inverse problem or parameter estimation, or oftentimes people just say a measurement, you know, where we take the observed data and we try to measure this parameter of interest. Now, inside of those simulators, um, there are often a lot of additional random variables that occur that we don't get to see in our experiments. So um, in, a, in the case of particle colliders, you know, when there's a collision, uh, there are all sorts of unstable particles that we don't get to observe in our, uh, our detectors. And those kinds of things are, are what I refer to as latent variables, and I'll use the variable Z to, to denote them. Um, so this, this probability model of the observed data X, the latent variable Z, given the parameters theta, is this sort of forward direction, and this really, you know, is, has most of what we want. Um, and you can think of the simulator, like symbolically at least, as encoding this probability uh, distribution. Now, this I'll, I'll just kind of put this on the side, and I'll go over it quickly. But um, I just want to say that, um, you know, when talking about simulation-based inference, people often ask, "But what if the simulator doesn't match the re the real data exactly?" And that is uh, absolutely a real concern. Um, that concern is not just something specific to simulators. It's a, it's a problem of statistical inference in general. Um, so whenever you're doing statistical inference, it's being done in the context of some statistical model. Um, if your model is you know, misspecified, meaning it doesn't actually you know, describe the real data generating process, then definitely you're going to have some problems. Um, now here, the model is the simulator itself. And so it may not be perfect, but I think what you you know the right mindset is to compare the simulator to what you would do otherwise, which might be some very simplistic uh, kind of equation uh, describing some distributions like Gaussians and you know or falling exponentials or something like that. Um, so I do think that the simulator is probably including you know more effects and is closer to the true data journeying process than a lot of the simple formulas that we might use. Now, if you want to account for mismodeling. Uh, you you know, oftentimes the approach that we have is we just add more and more complexity to the simulator. We have an original simulator, and then we add uh, sort of more knobs to it to try to describe some sort of residuals, um, and that introduces additional parameters into the model, which are not necessarily the things you want to infer, and I'm going to refer to those as nuisance parameters new. Um, I see Ali has a question. Uh, if it's quick, we can do it. Otherwise, uh... maybe a clarification. Thank you. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Because I, I'm not really quite familiar with this um, setting, but but if we have all the parameters and if we know basically the this p of x and z given theta, what is the role of inference? I mean, if, if we know the model that that sort of gives rise using, I mean, we use it for simulation to give rise to the observations. What what are we trying to do inference on? 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. It's sort of like, well, if you already know it, then what are you learning, right? Yeah, so um, so I think that the important point would be something like the parameter theta might be like the Higgs boson mass. Like we have a theory of what the standard model looks like, but we don't know the mass of the Higgs boson. Um, and so we can, we can describe what we think the data would look like for any particular mass of the Higgs boson, uh, but we don't know what it is. And we would like to infer the mass of the Higgs boson based on data. Or similarly, you would like to infer like the cosmological constant for the expanding universe or, or something like that. Like for black hole uh, you know, mergers, uh, you sort of have a theory for what the gravitational waves would look like for different mass black holes and if their spins are you know, pointed in different directions. Uh, but um, so you have a model for all those possible possibilities, but you then you get some real data and you would like to infer, you know, what were the masses of the black holes for this particular system. Got it, got it. Thank you for yeah. clarifying. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so so here's the same picture basically as before, just uh, with additional set of uh, nuisance parameters here, new. And they, they may describe things like unknown calibration constants of your detector or you know something like some part of the noise model of your instrument or something like that, which you don't necessarily care about uh, inferring directly, but it's going to influence the distribution of the data. So you need to take it into account when you're doing inference. Um, now, when I'm thinking about simulators, I think there's these broadly two classes of simulators that's worth uh, mentioning. Uh, one are things that have a sort of deterministic evolution of some initial state. So that's where you have like differential equations, things like uh, fluid dynamics or in-body simulations and cosmology. So you set up some initial conditions and the whole thing evolves deterministically. Um, and then there are others where the simulation has stochasticity or randomness uh, inside. So here's an example of uh, you know, a simulator of, of this little desk toy uh, where you're dropping balls and the balls kind of bounce to the left or to the right. Um, and uh, you can think of uh, you know, the path through this lattice of nails as sort of the latent variable Z and where they, uh, where they you know, which bin they end up in, with, you can think of as the variable X. And you would like to know like the probability distribution of uh, the variable X, you know, the, the sort of you know, where the balls land here. Um, now, if you wanted to know the probability that uh, one of the balls lands in, say, this bin, uh, to calculate it, you would need to integrate over all the possible paths through the lattice of nails that end up in that bin. And, the, and that integral is what makes things challenging. So, uh, so you might, your simulator might you know, tell you what's going on you know, at, at every little location here, but if you want to know this probability, you have to sum over all you know, this sort of combinatorially large number of possible paths. Uh, that take you there. And uh, that integral, um, you know, as your simulator gets more and more complex, it just becomes computationally intractable. And in principle, it's well-defined, just but in practice, it's uh, you're not going to do it. Um, I don't know if you have another question, Ollie, or if your hand's just up from before. Okay, uh, I'll keep going. So, um, so this Sorry, motivate, yeah. yeah, so this, wait, did you have a question or no? Okay. Um, so this motivates a sort of uh, a style of inference or a class of inference methods uh, where you try to do inference on the parameters, but, uh, but the likelihood function is intractable. So what, what, what the only thing you're sort of able to do is uh, generate synthetic data from your simulator. And so in most inference techniques, whether they're frequentist or Bayesian, the, you know, the likelihood function uh, looms large. And one of the things that you need to do is be able to calculate the likelihood you know, of uh, uh, for the parameter theta given the data, and um, and uh, and so in this setting, you're so that that object is intractable. So how do you go about doing it? Um, and so because that you know the likelihood is intractable, that this class of techniques is, was originally dubbed uh, likelihood free inference, um, which if you sort of know what's going on is maybe an okay name, but I think it causes a lot of confusion. So uh, I personally prefer the term simulation based inference, um, and uh, and so partially, you know, and various techniques that are that come to try to solve this problem, one of the very first things you do is try to approximate the likelihood function. And then you do inference in the kind of typical way. So really the, the, the core issue is going to be how can I approximate the likelihood function? Um, and uh, if, if all I have is, a, is the ability to simulate samples from my simulator. Um, and this, and again, this uh, approach is going to apply both to Bayesian and frequentist approaches. 
So if we think of here's uh, some data, you know, collision at the LHC, the data is very, very complicated, very, very high dimensional. Um, if we think about the theory, oftentimes you think about things like this on my coffee mug, you know, there's this, the standard model uh, Lagrangian, you know, I'm, this is bit written in the language of quantum field theory. It has, you know, something like, you know, 20, whatever, seven parameters or something. Um, and, uh, and if you adjust those parameters in principle, you kind of, you can just say what's going to go on in the data. Now that is a really an oversimplification in some sense. Yes, it's all there, but if you actually look at the simulation pipeline, it's quite a bit more complicated. So you start off with some theory parameters, uh, and those equate that equation I just sh showed you. Then usually what we do is we draw these Feynman diagrams, which are some sort of like Taylor series perturbative expansion that you make. So you have all these Feynman diagrams. And we can simulate uh, basically the scattering of particles of you know the uh, of like quarks and you know Higgs bosons and things like this, and we know how to calculate that. But we don't observe these things in our detector. Uh, so this quark, for instance, is not something we're going to observe in our detector. Uh, so it's like a latent variable. Um, and instead, that that the that quark is going to initiate uh, more radiation. So the the actual thing that we simulate looks more like this. You have the in red in the middle there, there's this sort of hard scattering Feynman diagram. And then you have this enormous showering of radiation uh, where even though you sort of know the physics of what's going on at every one of those splittings, uh, the whole thing is sort of too complicated uh, to deal with anymore. And now you're putting it onto a computer. Um, and it has, this is where you start to see all these latent variables associated to this, uh, what's called the parton shower. Um, and then those particles uh, run out and smash into our detectors. And they uh, ionize the 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 you know leave energy deposits inside of the detector, and we simulate what's going on the, the passage of the, those particles in matter, um, and so the simulation has now uh, literally you know hundreds of millions of latent variables for one collision, describing all the different ionization you know uh, you know atoms getting ionized and things inside of their detector, and um, and so this is something that's you know very 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 complicated. And in the end, the observed data looks something like this. And so the, the part of the problem is that for that same collision, there are many possible stories about how uh, you could have produced different particles and how they could have ionized that would have led to the same uh, energy deposits in the detector. Um, so we have uh, software that sort of corresponds to each of these stages. Uh, tools like MadGraph and Pythia and Jayant that describe the, the, the physics of those different scales. And you can think of, we call them Monte Carlo tools because they use Monte Carlo techniques to sample, randomly sample what's going on. But if you know, Monte Carlo is also, you can think of it as a way of performing an integral. So these three different programs you can think of as sort of computationally approximating this integral. Um, yeah, but this integral is totally infeasible. So you can sample from it, you know, you can, you can sample a bunch of examples, uh, but if you want to say for this particular observed data X, you know, what is its probability, you would need to do this hundred million dimensional integral and that's never going to happen. Okay, so, um, okay, so what have particle physicists normally done? Normally we take this very complicated high dimensional data and then we make a histogram of a single variable or summary statistic, uh, you know, uh, uh, some observable we, we usually call it that's that's relevant for our task. So when we were searching for the Higgs boson, we knew that there was a you know particular quantity uh, where you sort of add up the energy and momentum of the of the, uh, the outgoing particles in a particular way, so that uh, if you actually are making a Higgs boson, you'll get a bump in your plot. Okay, and so the design of this particular summary statistic, which I'm calling S of X here, is, you know, it's like a feature engineering task, and it's something that's, you know, traditionally has been done by skilled physicists, uh, you know, the tailored for the task at hand. And then once you distill the high dimensional data down to a single summary statistic, uh, then the distribution that you want to know can be, you know, represented very well by just using a histogram. So particle physicists tend to just make histograms. Uh, so the red histogram there is, uh, is a histogram from simulations. You run a whole bunch of simulations and you fill a histogram and then that's your proxy for what's the distribution of the summary statistic given the parameters theta. Um, so this approach is great if you know how to design a good summary statistic, uh, but it doesn't scale if that summary statistic is sort of high dimensional. And if you, uh, if you, you know, as you, uh, you know, if you don't have a lot of good insight about how to make a good summary statistic, then this isn't going to be a very powerful approach. And sometimes you can show that really, if you want to get the most out of your data, you need to work with a high dimensional summary statistic. There, there is no 
one sufficient statistic that's going to do everything that you want to do. So, um, so the, the approach that I just described here, this is what particle physicists have been doing for a long time. There's a very closely related uh, approach that's called approximate Bayesian computation. Um, and, it's, uh, and it was for many years basically synonymous with this term likelihood free inference. So for many people, they think about likelihood free inference as a, as a specific algorithm and uh, as Bayesian in nature, but really that's part of the reason I didn't really like the term likelihood free inference is it has too much baggage associated to it. So, uh, but you see it's, it's uh, used heavily in uh, you know, systems and population biology, computational neuroscience, computer vision, healthcare sciences, et cetera. And the traditional approach for approximate Bayesian computation, I'll, I'll go through this quickly, is it's a Bayesian technique. So you would have a prior over your parameters theta. Um, then you would, you would randomly sample a particular value of theta from your prior then you would run your simulator with those settings and it would produce some synthetic data uh, here called D prime. And then you would wanna basically compare is the observed data look like the real data. And uh, if you could you know, do an exact comparison, uh, then you would be able to do exact inference. But uh, you know, if you have continuous value data, that's never going to uh, be an exact comparison. So, you, so instead you, have, you introduce some kind of ad hoc notion of distance between uh, your your observed data and your synthetic data, um, and if it's uh, close enough under some notion of distance, uh, then you sort of accept this parameter theta, and you do that many many times, and then this will basically give you a bunch of samples of theta that are distributed, you know, approximately according to the posterior distribution. Um, so that's a way to do it. Uh, I think if you think about it a little bit, it seems like yeah, this is probably not a very scalable solution and probably not going to work very well. If your data is high dimensional, um, and you would be right, that approach doesn't doesn't scale very well. Uh, but that's the basic. That's the basic. Uh, those have been the traditional approaches uh, until recently. And so with uh, and so that kind of extends this picture that I had before, where you sort of have observed data and you you calculate some summary statistic, and then you use that thing for for doing inference. Now, uh, I'll go over this kind of quickly. But in terms of like the dimensionality of the different things that we're thinking about. Uh, usually the summary statistics are just like one, two, maybe three dimensional. Uh, the parameters of interest that, you know, oftentimes people care about are, you know, in the tens or, you know, maybe hundred parameters of interest, but usually not a lot more than that. Uh, the observed data may be pretty high dimensional, you know, it may be like an image or something. So like, you know, hundreds or thousands of dimensional uh, dimensions. And then the latent variables may be very, very high dimension. So like in the high energy physics case, you know, the latent variables are, you know, there's millions of latent variables. So uh, this is just to kind of set a sense of scale for these different quantities. Um, so uh, uh, Gilles and Johan and I recently wrote a review paper where we basically we called it the frontier of simulation-based inference. And basically, said, you know, the traditional methods that I just described are kind of down here in the corner, where uh, on one axis, we're basically thinking about the dimensionality of the data. And along this axis, we're thinking about basically how you know, complex is your simulator in terms of how expensive is it to run and what's the dimensionality of the thing that you're trying to infer. Um, and what's happening is essentially machine learning is helping us work with higher dimensional data. Um, active learning techniques, which I'll describe in a little bit, where you sort of smartly decide where to run the simulator are allowing you to work with sort of more expensive simulators. And then there's another approach that kind of goes in the diagonal roughly where you sort of open up the black box of the simulator and you reach in there and you try to like extract some more information uh, from the simulator to make uh, learning more efficient. Um, so I'll be super quick on this. This is from 2017, but it's just to point out that basically uh, uh, from that previous workshop slide that I showed where, um, you know, till in 2017, you know, a few years went by and that was where um, it, there started to be a connection between a lot of what's going on in machine learning, uh, particularly that has to do with uh, things like generative adversarial networks and variational autoencoders and th these kinds of these kinds of ideas uh, started to uh, come together with uh, some of this uh, likelihood free or simulation based inference. Um, here it was also nice to see that uh, you know the particle physics was uh, uh, included as one of the examples. And again, you see this sort of simulators that do not admit a tractable density. That's the sort of machine learning jargon for the situation where you have a simulator, but the likelihood is intractable. 
Okay, so um, so I'll go through this part kind of quickly, just as like kind of a taxonomy, just to give you a feel of what all is out there. Um, but I'd say there are roughly two approaches for how to do simulation-based inference, and that there are kind of you know more modern things. So there's uh, I mentioned already, you know, approximate Bayesian computation. Uh, there are a few other approaches, and and the ones on the left here, you're sort of using the simulator directly to do inference, but you're trying to use it in a more uh, efficient technique, uh, I mean, a, an efficient way. And so there's uh, a, a class of approaches called probabilistic programming, uh, which I'll, I'll show you briefly. And then there are more that are more, you know, have more machine learning stuff going on in them, where essentially you try to learn a surrogate uh, for the simulator. Um, and then you use that surrogate for the simulator to, uh, to do inference. Um, so in our review paper, we sort of made these little flow charts, which I, you know, I'm not going to go through them all, but they, if you're trying to, <laughs> I found them to be pretty useful. Several people have given us generally good feedback about them. But the top row refers to the, the approaches that sort of use the simulator directly. The bottom row are the approaches that use machine learning to learn some sort of surrogate uh, for, the, uh, for the likelihood. Um, some of these approaches use unsupervised learning. Some of them use supervised learning. Some of them reach inside and augment the simulator so that you can do something you know, more powerful with them. And some of them use uh, active learning uh, techniques to make it more efficient. Um, so let me first just uh, show you a little bit about uh, the so-called probabilistic programming approach. Uh, and it's a, it's a version that is also using machine learning, but in a slightly different way. So here is some code. And what this code is going to do is randomly put little green bumpers down and then drop a bunch of balls and use a physics engine to let the balls bounce around. And, uh, and so these three uh, executions of this program, you know, that each one is different because there's a random number generator involved. Um, and uh, you can think of them as three samples out of a prior distribution over executions of this program. Um, and now here are three uh, runs of the same program, but now conditioned on 20% of the balls landing in this little uh, box over here on the right. Okay, so you can think of this as like a posterior distribution. So one way to do it would just be to run the simulator, uh, you know, a million times and find, you know, filter through the ones where 20% of the balls land on the right, but that would just be very, very inefficient, right? So the question is, is there a way that you can sort of uh, steer the simulator and bias it so that it will, you know, uh, it will put the 20% of the balls over here on the right, and that you can sample the posterior more efficiently. Um, so this approach is referred to as inference compilation. I'm not going to go through it too much, but basically you have, uh, uh, you know, this kind of relationship between the, the simulator and some external thing, which is usually a neural network that reaches inside of your simulator and tries to bias it uh, to do what you want. Uh, so we worked with a particular particle physics simulator called Sherpa. Um, which is, you know, about a million lines of C++ code. And uh, essentially, you know, there's this external process that's reaching in and biasing the random number generators. That's what these kind of lines are sort of reaching in. And, uh, and for that, we used a, a very, very, very large neural network <laughs> to, uh, to try to bias it. Um, and that allows us to do basically uh, posterior inference over the simulator. Um, uh, and this work was done in connection with Intel. Uh, we ran at NERSC. Uh, there were, um, it, you know, there were, it was a, you know, it was using supercomputers and things like that. So I thought I would highlight this because it seems like it's of interest to the A3, D3 uh, crowd. Um, the same code and that same protocol that we developed to be able to sort of control uh, legacy simulators that have been written in like C++ or Fortran or Julia or something like that um, uh, has now been used, for instance, in the context of uh, like COVID and malaria models and things like that, where you have epidemiology models um, and you would like to bias them to try to uh, uh, basically do posterior inference. Um, and so that's, I think that stuff's pretty cool, but I'm not going to say more about that now. Okay. Um, so the next uh, set of techniques that I'll talk about like broadly involve using uh, some sort of deep learning techniques to uh, learn, you know, approximate the simulator and to have some surrogate that you can use for doing inference. And uh, given that I've been talking kind of slow, I'll go quickly through this part so that I can kind of highlight some of the examples at the end. Okay, so um, <clears throat> when you go to do this, there are a few different approaches about what is it that you're going to use uh, deep learning to try to approximate. Uh, so you can, for instance, try to approximate a likelihood ratio. Uh, oftentimes the likelihood ratio is good enough for doing, uh, doing inference. Um, and if you're learning a ratio 
there's even details about which ratio do you try to learn. You can either try to learn the likelihood ratio between two hypotheses, or you can try to learn the ratio between like a conditional and a marginal or the you know, posterior and the prior and the likelihood and the evidence. There are various different things that you can try to learn that are uh, useful for doing statistical inference. Um, you can also just try to learn the likelihood uh, directly. Um, here is where things like normalizing flows are, are used quite a bit. Um, or you can try to learn the posterior distribution directly. Um, so that's this, you know, here's one of these approaches. It talks about using supervised learning techniques to learn a likelihood ratio. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through it uh, in detail because of time, but the, the upshot of it is that uh, it's you turn the problem into a, simply a binary classification problem. So the same thing you would do between like red dots and blue dots or between cats and dogs. You train a classifier to try to tell one class versus the other. Uh, you can train it with uh, the binary cross entropy loss. Um, the, the classifier that you learn is sort of a one to, you know, with, with approximates this sort of what's called the Bayes optimal classifier. And that is one to one with a likelihood ratio. So you can kind of massage the output of this classifier to learn a likelihood ratio. And then instead of just learning two specific classes like cats and dogs, you can learn uh, two classes that are, you know, parameterized by theta. And this is what I call a parameterized classifier. This is some work that Jill and I did back in 2015. Um, and, then, uh, and then once you have that, this is basically the picture. You have your simulator. The simulator uh, has all sort of latent variables inside that you don't really care about. It exposes some parameters theta. Um, so you, you, you scan across the parameters theta. You generate some training data. Um, and then you have a neural network that, is, uh, that takes as input both the data and the values of the parameters. And now the values of the parameters are unknown to you, right? Uh, so this is kind of just turns into a function of the parameters theta, and your neural network is trying to approximate a likelihood ratio. And if your neural network can learn this function, then you can use it to do inference. Um, and so it's kind of a two-stage process. You know, first you generate a bunch of training data and you learn this uh, neural network that approximates the likelihood ratio. Um, and so, but once you pay that upfront uh, training cost, then the inference is very, very fast. That's just however long it takes to evaluate a neural network. Um, so you refer to this as an amortized approach because you, you're paying that simulation cost up front. Um, and that's great compared to, for instance, uh, approximate Bayesian computation, where you have to run the simulator while you're doing inference. Here, you run the simulator up front, and then inference is super duper fast. Um, so here are some examples where we plot like the maximum likelihood estimator, or we plot like the minus two times the log likelihood ratio for a bunch of, uh, and we you know able to run inference in this example thousands of times. We you know we recover things like Wilkes theorem, so we make all these connections back to classical statistical literature, um, and that's great. Okay. Okay, so that I know I'm speaking quickly, but you know, okay, um, here we go. So, so I talked about machine learning a little bit. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about active learning. So intuitively, you can imagine, uh, and that's what you know happens in this part of these flowcharts, is that intuitively you can imagine that if you have like say a prior distribution that's very broad, and you get data that says like, oh, I can really uh, measure the parameters very accurately. So your posterior distribution is very concentrated. Uh, then you don't really want to run your simulator in all this region of parameter space that's like a very bad fit for the data. You really want to run the simulator only in the relevant regions around, you know, where the posterior is, is concentrating. Um, so the question is, you know, is there a more efficient way to do that? And, and, and there is. Uh, and so th those set of techniques are usually referred to as like sequential, you know, you stick sequential in the front of the name. <laughs> so you have, you can sequentially learn either the likelihood ratio or a posterior or the likelihood. Um, and there are various different papers that have kind of explored these ideas. Um, and uh, and there, there are now like various benchmarks that people have worked on to try to show, you know, how these different approaches uh, scale and how much more efficient they are. Um, and see here, here I'll point to a software package that's put together by Jacob Mackey's group. Um, Jacob Mackey is mainly interested in computational neuroscience. That, so you see uh, you know, here, you know, this, uh, this is an example that has to do with spike trains for computational neuroscience. And, and this nice Python package has implemented a lot of these sequential techniques. Um, so, um, and it was also published in the Journal of Open Source Software, which is kind of nice. Uh, so this is a very nice, you know, package for getting started. And that same group uh, put out a paper that was basically benchmarking uh, the different kinds of approaches. So these different columns here are different approaches to simulation-based inference. Uh, 
the ones with S on the name here are the sequential versions. And then the rows are different kinds of uh, metrics for how well the techniques are working. So I'm not, I'm not gonna spend time here. Um, but uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that the computational neuroscientists tend to uh, have like one data set and they wanna do inference on that one data set. So the sequential approaches uh, make a lot of sense for them. Uh, so that you can kind of reduce the simulation budget to, you know, uh, and, and, you know, sort of intelligently use your simulator only in the relevant regions. Uh, but for a lot of particle physics problems, it's not necessarily the right uh, approach because in a lot of particle physics problems, we don't just have uh, one observation and then we're trying to infer the parameters theta. Oftentimes we have in uh, IID, like identically distributed independent observations. Um, and so, uh, so what we would really like to do is learn the likelihood function and then, uh, and then be able to sort of multiply the likelihood over all of the different observations uh, before doing inference. And so in that kind of situation, the sequential approaches are maybe not as uh, advantageous and then this kind of more amortized approach is, is better. Okay, so, um, so that's the kind of end of what I have to say about the like really like the the statistical part. Um, I'm going to flip through some examples. Um, I don't know in terms of timing if you can cut me off. I see it's we're approaching 40 minutes, but um, and then I'll have a couple you know uh, one statement to say in the conclusion. Okay, so for a particle physics example, here was one of the early works that we did where you see this you know it's a Feynman diagram of. Uh, particles scattering off each other. It involves the Higgs boson. Uh, this red dot here is a spot where the Higgs boson is interacting with whatever the W and Z bosons. And you can, you, there are theories in which this interaction gets modified. And those theories are parameterized by two, you know, two uh, real numbers, okay? And these are the coefficients of an effective field theory. Um, and so the inference problem is essentially to infer what are these two parameters. Um, Oh, but I should say, but the data is something, in this case, is something like 42-dimensional. So you're never going to fill a 42-dimensional histogram. Uh, and so our typical way of doing inference isn't going to work. And so the, the goal is, like, can we learn the, the distribution of this 42-dimensional observable as a function of these two parameters and then do inference? Um, and so here are some examples where uh, we first worked on an example where we could still evaluate the likelihood and we could see that we can approximate the true likelihood very accurately. And then we move to a problem where we can no longer evaluate the true likelihood. Um, but what we see is that there's a substantial gain and uh, and sensitivity of this analysis. This is the log likelihood curve. Zero is the standard model. You know, the steeper this log likelihood curve is, the more accurate your measurement is. And uh, the the amount that we improved the sensitivity of this was like adding something like 90% more LHC data. So this is like you know, and this is a flagship measurement at the LHC. So. Uh, so this is definitely like a worthwhile uh, thing to pursue. Um, here's another example, same basic idea. It's a different uh, physics use case, uh, but you see that from the traditional approaches, uh, here's a 2D you know, contour uh, and um, the red dotted line is the sort of traditional approach to this problem. You would like these contours to be as small as possible because that's a more precise measurement. And using these uh, you know, simulation-based inference techniques, we get to the blue ellipse, which is, you know, I don't know, it's several factors more data, LHC data. Um, so that's, you know, so that's pretty exciting. Um, in terms of software to try to make this happen, we developed a tool called MadMiner that interfaces with a lot of the like, uh, you know, the, the simulators that particle physicists use. It implements several of these different uh, techniques, including some of the fancy ones with, with an augmented simulator that I didn't describe in detail. Um, and um, so this, this tool is pretty nice. The very first version of it though, it was kind of up to you to generate all the data and train, you know, you had to kind of do the workflow manually. So what we've done uh, uh, recently is to work on uh, tying this to one of these, uh, uh, all the different steps in this sort of <laughs> workflow, um, they have they all have different software dependencies and they have different computational requirements. So for instance, when you go to generate synthetic data, you need all of the software for the simulation. So we have, you know, Kubernetes, like uh, Docker containers for, uh, for all of those uh, uh, simulation parts. And then uh, this workflow sort of expands into all these jobs that are uh, generating the synthetic data. Um, and then it feeds, and this at the bottom is another workflow where it's been scaled up, you know, to, to bigger jobs. Um, they produce synthetic data, and then it goes to another set of jobs that are training a bunch of machine learning models. 
Uh, those want to use GPUs and they have a different set of software requirements. Um, and then in the end, you get a, the trained model and you would like to use it to do statistical inference. And that's the kind of bottom part down here. So we basically we have these workflows that are defined and you can you can distribute them effectively on big uh, clusters. Currently, Rihanna doesn't really know how to deal with GPUs. So this is something that would, you know, uh, hopefully will be remedied fairly soon. Uh, but there are other kind of workflow techniques that, you know, can take advantage of GPUs and things. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, so moving from high energy physics, I already mentioned Jacob Mackey's group. Uh, he's the, that, the group that wrote this simulation or SBI Python tool. Uh, I'm just going to highlight here that there's a paper they have in eLife, which is kind of a review of these techniques in the, com in the context of computational neuroscience. Um, I'm not going to say more about it. It's great work. I just, uh, for time, I'll just skip past it. And the last thing I'll mention is more on the multi-messenger astrophysics side. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, so here's one example that we did where we were interested in, here's a galaxy. The galaxy is surrounded by a halo of dark matter. The, the halo of dark matter is not totally smooth, it's clumpy. That's what these blue clumps are. They're clumpy hunks of dark matter. And this plot shows you, you know, as a funk, this is the horizontal axis, the mass of the, one of the sub halos. And then this is the number density of those. So it's basically the distribution of, uh, of sub halos uh, as a function of their mass. And, uh, and, and, and there, here there are different uh, different theory scenarios where that mass distribution gets truncated at different places, and that has to do with the mass of the of the uh, the particle nature of dark matter, the mass of the dark matter particle itself. So, if you can measure this distribution, you could indirectly start to infer something about dark the mass of dark matter, which would be great. Um, the problem is you don't see dark matter, right? So, so how do you do it? Uh, well, one thing that you can do is is use gravitational lensing. So here we are on Earth. Uh, we look at some distant uh, galaxy that's being lensed by this foreground galaxy. And that gives you pictures that look like this. And so somehow the clumpiness of what's going on inside of this lensed image tells you something about the distribution, uh, the mass distribution of subhalo, of dark matter subhalos. But it's not very obvious, right? So how do you do it? Uh, so, uh, and this is very relevant for like LSST and Euclid and, and, and you know, uh, future surveys. Um, so our two parameters in this case were basically just the slope of the power law for the mass distribution and then the overall normalization, which is the fraction of dark matter mass and subhalos. Um, we sample from that and we get a bunch of the little blue dots. These are the subhalos that are surrounding uh, a galaxy. So those are my latent variables. Um, and then we run the lensing, uh, you know, uh, simulation, which is deterministic, and then we add Poisson, sh you know, shot noise uh, for the the photons, and we get out images that look like this. Um, we train this uh, these uh, neural likelihood, uh, you know, surrogates. Um, it's an amortized setup so that because we're going to have a bunch of images like this, and then we get to something like this. So here on the there's going to be an animation on the left. You see images coming in. And as the images come in, we can very quickly update our posterior distribution over these two parameters, which are the power law index and the fraction of dark matter and subhalos. Um, so that's, you know, that seems pretty cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was the work with uh, Sid Misha Sharma, Johan Bremer, Jaloup, and Yuri Hermans. Um, and there's been some other follow up work. Um, here's an, some other work that was done by uh, Jill and company that was using it, using it for LIGO. Um, here, the idea is basically you see, you know, you see the uh, stress, you know, uh, waveform coming in from the two uh, detectors of LIGO, and you want to quickly try to infer where in the sky did this come from uh, with the probability distribution. And so this uh, sort of amortized approach, again, quickly gives you a, a, a probability distribution on the sky of where, where this thing happened. Uh, there's been follow-up work. Well, there's several other papers in this neighborhood, and then recently there was some follow-up work that included Jacob Mackey, also Bernard Schulkopf, if you know him, uh, and then and then uh, people that are more you know uh, uh, you know squarely in the LIGO uh, world, um, and they you know this may be one of the state of the art uh, results here, but they are able to uh, basically to get the same quality inference on all of the parameters that you that you want to infer in a in a you know a LIGO event uh, very quickly. Um, and, and they get uh, comparable results to the very expensive uh, MCMC approaches that are used inside of LIGO, uh, something called DINGO, or sorry, the, sorry, LIGO's MCMC uh, techniques. 
Okay, so there is more stuff there that I'll just you know point to some papers. There are one you know more things that have here have to do with Gaia data. Um, this one has to do with the uh, gamma ray excess uh, and the Fermi data. Um, so you know, this is definitely very relevant for you know for multi messenger astrophysics. Um, and uh, and then I'll just conclude uh, by saying you know I don't know I think this is pretty exciting stuff. I mean one way of thinking of it is just that in the evolution of scientific inference, you know or you know the the inference and statistical tools that are used for science, you know, you know, you had major events like the introduction of of optimization algorithms that can work with a you know a, a nonlinear likelihood function, and then there was Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, but both of those required the likelihood function to be tractable, and this I think is kind of the next era of that evolution, which is where you're working with uh, simulators that have a much more detailed description of what's going on, but the likelihood is no longer tractable. And so being able to solve those inverse problems is like a really important moment for science, I think, which is why I'm so excited about it. Um, and, uh, and if you think about, okay, you know, I talked a lot about the different techniques, but uh, there's a very important issue here, which is the computational infrastructure in the background to make all of this stuff work. And what you see is that, you know, when you try to do things this way, there are different patterns that emerge um, because you would like to sort of you know, efficiently generate simulated data, train neural networks, and have that whole thing coordinated in a, in a much more efficient way than what we're used to doing. Um, and uh, there are various trade-offs that you run into. For instance, these sequential approaches that use active learning, they can be useful for reducing some simulation budget. Uh, but in other cases, you might want to use this amortized approach because it's faster. So it really depends on what, you know, how you take this learned model and embed it in, for instance, some sort of, uh, you know, if you want to point telescopes, uh, you know, to try to quickly, you know, see if there's some sort of optical counterpart for some, uh, you know, uh, neutron star merger, you know, then, you know, the amortized approach is very important, right? So, so depending on your use case, there are different kind of computational patterns that emerge. And, uh, and so that hopefully is pretty relevant and interesting for this audience. So with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. That was an excellent, excellent talk for us to start this seminar series with. Um, right, we have time for questions. And I'm sure there should be some. So please raise your hand or post it onto um, the chat window in Zoom. Yeah, so Zach asked, uh, yeah. or Zachary asked if uh, how robust or correct do the simulations have to be? Um, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, there's not really a not really a generic answer to that question. Um, you know, if that was what I was kind of referring to at the very uh, early on when I talked about uh, about uh, model misspecification. So, you know, if your if your model your simulator is not accurate, it will introduce some notion of bias and how severe that is is you know depends on details um, usually what people do is they either try to introduce nuisance parameters in the simulator to like add more flexibility so that it describes the data more accurately um, or there are various techniques which i didn't talk about where you try to essentially penalize the 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 neural network so that it learns uh, essentially summaries, it learns features of the data that are more robust. So it basically tries to restrict itself to the variables that are well modeled. Um, and I didn't really discuss those techniques in this talk, but uh, there's that's another strategy. Uh, Michael Coughlin has a question. Yeah, hi, really nice talk. Um, so you talked about um, some of the size of some of these emulators. I'm wondering if you could say a few words about how um, uh, how much physics or you know other special you know how, how special are the networks that you're having to build for your various use cases? Like, can I take a network that you built for high energy physics and plug it into gravitational wave astronomy? Or, yeah, how yeah how ubiquitous yeah. are you finding these things are? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So when I give talks on the subject of oftentimes I pair like the one half of the talk is about what I sort of what I talked about and the other half of the talk is about the design of the neural networks themselves because I didn't really say anything about the neural networks here um, so in some cases you can use a, a kind of generic neural network you know that as long as it can you know if it's if you're doing the likelihood ratio thing you need a classifier so you want the neural network to take the right type of input so if you're working with images you know you want you can use a convnet or something or if you're um, but but other than that, you don't have a lot of physics inspired inspired notions going on. But uh, 
but that, that there's another body of work, which is what I refer to generally as like inductive bias or like the kind of physics aware or physics, you know, physics aware machine learning, which is where you try to structure the, uh, the neural network architecture itself. So that somehow reflects what you know about the data generating process. And that's where you have opportunities to incorporate symmetries or various different things. So some, some of this uh, work that I mentioned at the end um, with the, um, um, you know, there, there are various things that are done to incorporate some symmetries. Like, I mean, one, you know, here they're like convolutional neural network architectures that are involved, but the, uh, um, in this case with, with LIGO, there's an unknown sort of time shift between the two. And that's, you can also think of that as a sort of like, they think of it as a symmetry in that paper, but they do something kind of bespoke uh, to try to incorporate that, you know, that thing that they know about the data so that the machine learning task is easier. Um, and then, uh, you know, here there's examples where the convolutional neural networks are working on this on the sphere, right? So they use these spherical convolutional neural networks. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's basically the, the, the high level statement is that if you have some insight into the data generating process and you can incorporate that into the neural networks, then there are some things you don't need to learn from data and you can, you can get away with fewer simulations and the whole thing can be more sample efficient. Um, and it's a, there's a, a bunch of work on that topic, but I didn't discuss it here. Thank you. Um, question from Jan Stroop. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for the nice talk, very inspirational. Um, I have a question about your 90% your increase of the LHC data. So uh, mm -hmm. how much more could you have gotten? I, I, I'm trying to, to, to understand if we build new experiments and, and have to design the detectors, right? Um, can we learn something about how to design the experiments to maybe even get more information from these methods? Um, yeah, no, that's, I think, a very interesting, exciting direction. Um, I didn't mention it here. I don't know. I might have some slides, but uh, <laughs> uh, we had a little, uh, yeah, we had a little dummy. Can you see my screen here? Uh, we had this little uh, dummy example where basically the thing that's called ABC here is essentially what I was just discussing. Uh, this is like the simulation based inference module. Um, and the idea here is basically you're doing a loop where you're trying to optimize the experimental design. And, uh, and so you're in the process of doing that, you do something like you try to optimize some expected information gain over which, you know, which experiment could I do that's going to give me, you know, teach me the most. And in this, this kind of dummy example, um, we uh, we did something where we coupled it to a physics simulator, and we and we wanted the parameter we wanted to measure was the weak mixing angle or the Weinberg angle, and the parameter that we were adjusting was uh, the polarization of the beams and the energy of the collider. And after a few iterations of this thing, it learned that it should run the collider just above or below the Z peak, which is like what you classically would learn to do as a you know, uh, so uh, that stuff becomes very computationally expensive. Um, and so, uh, but we, we did this in like the most naive way here. Uh, so there are definitely people out there that are thinking about uh, the kind of co-design and, and experimental design uh, in the context of this simulation-based inference. And I think it's super interesting. Thank you. Um, Philip Harris. Hi, Kyle. Thanks for your talk. It was great. Um, so I wanted to ask a question. Um, so if I, if I take a lot of these kind of likelihood embedding um, or likelihood free inference techniques, I see this as a way of like compressing the data dramatically. Um, and, you know, it's not perfect, but it's a great way to kind of um, like, you know, make a optimized, you know, approach to like, let's say simulations where you you contain you get 90% of the effects you know in a very like compressed you know form I'm wondering how much you've like pursued this like like how much how far can you shrink like the latent space uh, in terms of compressing information yeah that's a good question so the the um so in uh well this this you know this paper in particular which is a follow up of the the one that we had done earlier is that there are ones where you try to learn the whole likelihood function, you know, and, and in some sense, the compression is weird because at the end you get one number, you know, uh, but uh, you only get that one number once you specified all the parameters, right? So really you get a function. And so you can think of, you compressed it into a function, uh, but there are other situations where 
like if you only have two parameters you want to measure, um, then in some cases you can you can uh, compress the data down into two what are called sufficient statistics that don't lose any information. But that's only in a very special case, which if you're in the so-called uh, exponential family. But if you're doing very precise measurements, you can kind of expand around something. You can sort of like take the standard model and little perturbations that are in the exponential family, and then you can boil it all down to two parameters. Um, and so it's kind of locally, it's good. But and as you move away, you, you lose a little bit of information. Um, but that's like, you know, it's kind of tied to some very principled approaches. Um, if you're not making very uh, precise measurements where you have like a pretty good idea of what the right, like, you know, standard cosmology and the standard model, you have a pretty good idea that you're just looking for small deviations. Um, if you're in the, something like the, you know, this gravitational wave situation, you have no idea where it's going to be at the beginning, right? So you, you can't really, you know, this is not going to be well approximated by that kind of thing, you know, but uh, there's a, a bit of a continuum. Um, and in some cases, yeah, especially in cases if you're like, you think that you have a pretty good guess, um, that approach is pretty well motivated. Uh, but yeah, I think you're also right that even if you don't, even if you're in a situation like this where you don't have a good idea what's going to look like, somewhere in the neural network here, there's a bottleneck, you know, and that bottleneck is basically the compression that you're talking about, right? So, um, so it's weird for physicists because it's some uninterpretable, you know, like bag of numbers, but it's a, it is basically that compressed version of the data. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask more, like, if you invert the, these networks, right, you can make a simulator, but there's, they're not perfect, right? There's information loss. But, so I was wondering if you've done like comparisons like that, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, there's stuff in the neighborhood, but maybe not exactly what you have in mind. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, David Newman. Uh, I put a comment in the chat and I'd oh. like to elaborate on it a bit. Uh, have you looked at, I can make a question out of it. Uh, have you looked at uh, some of the methods uh, of model selection in statistics and tried to apply them in this framework? Because it looks like an excellent uh, framework uh, and a lot of progress from a conference that I went to in 2003 where statisticians and physicists got together. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think what, what I like about this the this approach, or at least the way that I'm trying to frame it, is that <clears throat> is that there's kind of a, a break between um, uh, two parts. One is like if you had a tractable likelihood, all the things that you would do, and that includes hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, and model selection, and experimental design, and all the things, right? And there's you know a, an enormous amount of classical uh, statistical literature that's been developed there, and there's also all sorts of new ideas that are coming up to make that even better. But yeah. almost all of that stuff assumes that you have you can evaluate the likelihood, and then there's this kind of uh, okay, but then, you know, most of our simulators, you can't do that, right? So what I like about this is it's not really trying to solve all of the problems. It's really trying to solve the specific problem of how can you accurately estimate a likelihood or likelihood ratio or posterior or whatever the thing is that you want. And then once you've done that, you can plug it into all of the existing solutions that, we, that are being developed or already exist for like model selection. So there definitely are some, uh, some papers. Uh, I know of some work in the kind of cosmology setting that do model selection problems in this, uh, you know, intractable likelihood setting. Um, and they try to kind of put those two things together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh, you have experimental design in there, and that's great. Uh, this is sort of another tool where you may have com uh, competing models and uh, that, that are quite different. <laughs> and you can kind of do Bayesian inference at a higher level once you've done it separately for each of the models. In some cases, you can combine the models if they're sufficiently alike into a single framework uh, using prior distributions. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think it's, uh, um, and I, you know, ultimately a lot of the scientific questions we want are, you know, phrased in that way. So um, I definitely think that these higher level things like model selection and experimental design are, 
are super interesting. And then the, you know, and the inference problem is kind of like the, the easiest one of those, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but the, but the, the hard part was working with the simulators. So, um, so hopefully, well, you know, there's some progress going in that direction. Okay. All right. Thank you. And with that, I think we'd like to thank again, Kyle for his excellent talk. Um, for those who are interested, um, the next A3D3 seminar will be, um, I guess it's going to be Monday, March the 7th at this time in MMA, and details will be posted and, and circulated uh, closer to the time. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a good rest of your day.